Welcome to this new build video, and this is a very unique one in that I'm gonna take an existing kit, which is the ESAM 58 from Estes. It's a BT-60 rocket, but I'm gonna modify it to adapt the new RPM altimeter and the ACE Apogee chute ejection system. Uh, this is a prototype of a new design from a very good friend of mine, and he's asked me to start doing some testing on this equipment and I've already been doing some testing on the RPM. This is the Rocket Performance Monitor. It's, a, it's an accelerometer based altimeter. But one of the cool things about this is that it has the option of hooking into a servo motor which will activate at Apogee a release for this panel to be uh, removed deploying the onboard parachute. And it's all, again, based on accelerometer data. It's not barometric in any way, shape, or form. So in order, in order to adapt this and this into a rocket, uh, you need at least a BT-60. And I was at the store the other day and they had some ESAM 58s, which is a BT-60 design. But I'm going to have to modify this in that I'm gonna cut the top portion of the body tube off to replace with the ACE unit. And I'm gonna modify the fins down at the bottom a little bit just to make things a little simpler because I'm not going for this look. I just need the basic parts out of this kit to build up a flyable test vehicle for the ACE and the RPM. So let's do a quick uh, unbagging, I guess. You can't really say unboxing, but uh, yeah, let's just go ahead and pull some parts out and I'll show you what parts we're gonna use out of this kit. Uh, obviously, we're gonna use the main body tube the BT-60, and whatever portion of it is the equal length of our ACE unit, which is about right there, that's where we're gonna, we're gonna cut the tube and remove this portion of it. Um, there is a small payload bay that's gonna go over the altimeter, but this will just be additional length. We're not going to incorporate that into the length of the body tube. I'm just gonna consider that extra length on top of it. So again, we're gonna we're gonna base it on that distance right there. And this is what the nose cone will also connect to. Now I, this I'm gonna have to cut this nozzle off. But uh, this nozzle, I'm sorry, this uh, shoulder off the nose cone is what's gonna go into this payload bay, which then plugs into the top of the ACE unit, which will then be attached to the lower body tube, which will have the fins and the motor. The only other major modification I'm going to make is the ESAM 58, of all things, comes with an 18 millimeter motor mount design. Uh, basically, it's to run on B's and C motors. But I want to get this rocket up there where we can do some serious testing, and I want to at least do D's, even E motors. So to do that, I had to upgrade and buy a motor mount set for 24 millimeter. So it's, it's a very simple swap out. I'm just gonna, instead of the 18 millimeter, we're gonna put in a 24 millimeter. That way we can get the, the rocket up high where we can do some good Apogee testing on the units. So with that explanation, I hope uh, all that made sense to you. Again, some new equipment, some prototype equipment. Uh, again, you've already seen the RPM do some flight testing. And I'm not going to actually utilize the ACE until I'm confident that we've got this down pat and it's uh, consistent. Once we do, then I'm going to attempt to uh, deploy this. And again, like I said, it does not use motor ejection for parachute ejection. It's all based on Apogee. When it reaches Apogee, the accelerometer will trigger the servo motor inside to spin up and release a magnet, which will, again, deploy this door, taking the chute out with it. So again, no ejection charge, no chance of burning up your parachute or anything like that. It's, it's all self-contained in this one unit. And uh, I am really looking forward to doing some flight testing, but in order to do that, we gotta get this rocket built. So let's get going. Okay, the first step I wanna do in building this rocket is to get the fins uh, papered, but we're not gonna use paper actually. We're gonna use polystyrene plastic. And to be specific, this is 0 0.010 inches thick. It's almost like paper, but it's a plastic material. Uh, recently, I've been sheeting my fins in paper, copy paper, 
But uh, I want to give credit to James Duffy from Rocket Arrow and his uh, YouTube channel where I saw him do a video where he was sheeting with plastic. And the results were, in my mind, just mind-blowing. Like, I just could not get over how clean uh, it surface it laid down. So I'm anxious to give it a try, and I thought, you know, we're gonna use this rocket as a test bed for electronics. Let's go ahead and use it as a test bed to try out the new polystyrene sheets. So what I wanna do first is set these aside. I wanna sand the fins down while they're still in their template. Uh, this is 3 32 inch, very light bolt actually. It's very lightweight. Just want to kind of smooth it down, take off any little ridges or bumps. Not a whole lot to really take off, but uh, we want to make it as smooth as we can. And I'm just using some 220 grit sandpaper. Okay, now that we've got that sanded down, let's go ahead and cut these out. Basically just trim off the little tabs. And like I said, this balsa is so soft. This is like a hot knife through butter. There's zero resistance. So, see, there's one. separate these two from each other. Really the only thing we need to do now is sand off those little tabs, but what I want to do is just go ahead and line all four fins together. And this is the advantage of these new modern day laser cut fins. They are so exact right out of the gate. There's so very little to actually do to them. But uh, get them kind of, you know, they're, get them equal, all, all four sides as best you can. Uh, then I'm just going to take my sanding bar and I'm just going to sand them together to remove those tabs. As soft as this balsa is, it's not taking too much to get them. Yeah, see that's already done there. And you can actually see the, the brown soot from the burn coming off onto the, uh, the sandpaper. That's from where the laser actually cut through the wood and left that charred uh, finish on it. And one other thing I, I'm going to point out, I'm not sure if the camera can pick this up, but these fins have a natural warp to them. The wood was not very flat right out of the packaging. So by laying down the adhesive and then the plastic, and then I'm going to compress them in my weighted down uh, plywood sheets, that along with the glue and the plastic is going to get those back straight and flat again. So by if, if we were just to fill in the grain and paint it, they would maintain that warp but by gluing the, the, the skin on it and flattening it, it should result in a flat surfaced fin. So that's another advantage to that. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and set those aside. Now let me show you what I've already done. This, these, these uh, polystyrene sheets came in, let's see, are they six? Yeah, 12 by six, basically one foot by half a foot. And I did some preliminary measurements and I was able to cut this in half and just one half at a time, we should be able to squeeze yeah that's gonna work just fine I'll be able to squeeze all four fins on one side glue it down trim them and then use the other sheet to do the other side so we can do all four fins with just this one full sheet so let me go ahead and clean this off and uh, lay down some uh, 
scratch paper and we're gonna use some spray on adhesive. I've got the 3M High Strength 90. Again, shout out to uh, James Duffy, thanks for the recommendation. Uh, from what I saw in his uh, example of using this, it worked perfectly. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, again, lay down some paper to spray onto and we'll get to skinning these fins with plastic here shortly. Okay, as you can see, I've got all my parts laid out ready for the adhesive. I've got the polystyrene here and I've got the four fins here. And one thing I did was I took some double, uh, some masking tape and I rolled it over on itself to make it double sided just to tack down each of these uh, surfaces to the, the paper so they don't blow away when I spray. So that they should hold them in, t in, in place. So I simply got my uh, 3M High Strength 90 I'll shake it up and I'm gonna make some nice slow even passes now the key to this is you don't want to lay it down like you would paint you don't need full coverage you don't want full coverage you just want to lay down that lacy pattern probably take two swipes across this and a couple swipes across the wood and we should be good to go and then I'm gonna give it five minutes to tack up and to um, uh, burn off the the fumes and that way we just got the adhesive left ready to go and it's it is contact cement so once you lay down the two surfaces that's the bond that's that's made right there so okay ready to go i'm just going to lay down a nice little pattern from right to left okay here we go let me test it real quick okay here we go Okay, there we go, just like that. I'm gonna let that sit for eh, four to five minutes. And then uh, once everything flashes off, they should be good to go. I'll carefully peel these off and uh, we'll come back to you and show you the actual adhesion of the two parts. Okay, it's been eight minutes since we sprayed these down. And uh, that gave me time to remove them from the backing paper and kind of get my bench cleaned off again. But uh, so that gives it enough time to dry and tack up. And now it's time to uh, lay down our parts on the plastic. So I'm just gonna individually here. Just uh, lay them down. And you wanna leave enough overlap so you can maneuver your knife and do some careful trimming. But yeah, it doesn't have to be too close to the edge. There we go. And another thing is you want to get some sort of roller. Uh, I prefer a hard rubber, but I did have this wooden one on hand. So we can use this to kind of help roll it in. And I'm still going to lay these under my weighted um, plywood sheets as well. So kind of a secondary chance of getting these nice and flat. So there we go some good adhesion there okay. okay and our last piece we'll drop in right here Just like so. Now I'm gonna take this whole thing and lay it on my plywood sheet. Lay another sheet of wax paper over that. My plywood and my weight. I'm going to give that about 10 minutes and then I'm going to reset up for my next, the next side, which is uh, just the same process. I'm not going to bother filming that, but um, when I do pull this out, I'm going to trim the, uh, the pieces out of the plastic sheet before I go ahead and glue on the other side. Okay, now that the fins have had time to uh, dry and completely adhere to the polystyrene backing, let me show you the back how that came out really good I'm very impressed with the smoothness of it but uh, now we need to trim these off so we can lay them down on the other side 
which is the second sheet right here, which is waiting to go. So I put a brand new blade on here, which will make cutting a lot easier. And I'm just gonna actually use the fin itself as the guide for the knife to follow. Just cut right along the side. I'll just do the first one just to show you how it's done and then I'll do the rest of them off camera. But if you've seen in my previous videos how I cut the, uh, the paper when I use copy paper, it's the exact same process. I'll be, I'll, I'll be honest with you, this plastic is acting as good if not better than the paper did. So, so far I'm very pleased, but uh, there we go. That is one nice smooth finish right there. Yeah, I, I think I'm gonna like this, uh, this process. So let me go ahead and do the remainder off camera and uh, we'll get to uh, skinning the other side. Okay, now that we've got the other side trimmed off and ready to go, I'm gonna do the same process. I'm gonna spray nice even coats. Not gonna saturate, just enough to get the, uh, the full coverage and then uh, I'm gonna let it dry for five to 10 minutes and do the same process before. There we go. Again, I'm gonna give that five to 10 minutes to dry and then uh, I'm gonna repeat the same process. Okay, same process as before. Uh, the, the glue is flashed off. You can see the backside, beautifully smooth uh, textured plastic. I, I just love that finish. I'm excited about painting that. But uh, now it's ready to go ahead and lay down, just like we did before. Just gonna evenly space them out here across the, the sheet. Like so. go. Give it a good roll down with the roller. All right. Gonna lay this in the press for a little while and then we'll go ahead and uh, trim it up. This is gonna be probably the best, uh, best set of fins I've ever created right here. I'm excited. Okay, we are going to now cut the body tube down to make up for the difference with adding in the ACE unit up top. So what I want to do is let me go ahead and get the upper portion removed and I need to get some sizing here. I want to line the cardboard up and what I'm doing is I'm measuring what I'm going to cut off and discard and then we'll keep the remainder for the lower portion. So let's see, we are adding this to it. Okay, so this is gonna discard. Draw a little arrow pointing down to the side we're keeping. Okay, let me take my BT60 cutting guide. These cutting tools are one of the most useful items at Estes ever came up with. Okay, I'm going to line that up on my mark. Right there. Bring in the other half. Cinch it down. There. It is locked on solid. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and take a straight edge razor. Get it in and just uh, just rotate the body tube into the blade. Oh, 
almost there. Got it. Okay. So this is what we're discarding because this is, should be the same size as our ACE unit. Yep, spot on. So this is gonna go back in the uh, spare parts box. This is going to be our lower body tube. sizing here okay. now the only additional length we've got is actually just this payload bay up front which is where the uh, RPM sits that's the only additional length we're adding to this to this rocket because like I said we're just replacing that portion right there with the ace additional and that's it and again Moving weight forward, not an issue. So as long as we add extensions to the nose, not the tail, we should be good to go. Um, and because we are running more tail weight, uh, nose weight, sorry, uh, we're gonna be able to get away with just the single four fins, the large fins, instead of the uh, four smaller ones. If you remember in the, in the original design, the ESAM has these four body tubes, I'm sorry, body fins, and then these four lower ones. We're going to, uh, skip adding those and just bring these but we're going to lower them to the base and uh, that should keep our center of uh, pressure equal with the center of mass up front and again the more weight we add to the nose the more stable it gets anyway so we should be good to go on that topic so there we go body tube is set i'm going to pull the uh, fins out they're still in my uh, press keeping them flat but uh, i gotta tell you they came out really good i'm really impressed with that uh, polystyrene skinning procedure. Uh, that may be my new go-to on all my future projects, to be honest with you. Uh, we'll see how it takes paint, but assuming it, it takes paint like any other, you know, like a nose cone or something, you know, plastic and smooth, um, I'm gonna be pretty pretty pleased with it. Now, one thing I wanna point out in, in this rocket, because it's the test bed for the ACE and the RPM, <clears throat> it, in future builds, we hope to uh, mount the blower tube to the ACE with screws or bolts. So this will remain somewhat, you know, quasi-permanent. Um, I, I really don't like the idea of gluing it because then you're, you know, if you want to transfer this to another rocket, you can't anymore. So I'm thinking we're going to bolt this on. But for the testing, at least the first couple of flights, I would say, on this rocket, um, I want to build a backup system, so I want to use the engine uh, discharge to eject uh, a secondary, basically a secondary chute out the front of this. So on the ejection, initially we should get the ACE release. If it doesn't work, then on a longer delay motor, we should get an ejection out this and it will pop this off and they'll be tethered and then it'll, you know, a secondary parachute will come out. That's that's kind of our backup plan on that. But uh, again, this is, uh, <laughs> we're kind of making it up as we go along. That may change, but for now, that's kind of the, the idea. But uh, now we've got a, a body tube to work with. I'm gonna get the fins out. We can mark this up and get the fins glued on. I wanna get the motor mount made up as well. And I, I've got a, uh, a 24 millimeter to a BT-60 tube motor mount because like I said earlier the ESAM 58 originally comes with an 18 millimeter and there's no way we're gonna do this on an 18 millimeter so I'm gonna uh, upgrade it to a 24 so we can run the e-motors so this will be a, a segment I'll get to here in a, a bit and uh, yeah we're just making progress slow but sure now this is the portion of the build where we're gonna build the motor tube and a lot of adjustments are being made on this particular portion of it. Uh, if you remember, the ESAM 58 came with an 18 millimeter motor tube. And I told you at the onset, we're gonna be uh, modifying that to use the Apogee motor mount kit, which converts a 60 millimeter, I'm sorry, a BT-60 size body tube down to a 24 millimeter motor. So we're upgrading from an 18 to a 24. 
but we need this to fit inside of the BT-60. So this kit gives you the body tube. It also comes with an engine hook, but we're gonna omit that because we're gonna use the retainer ring. Um, it does come with a, an engine block. We're gonna have to use this to glue in to prevent the motor from uh, thrusting any further forward. But the big thing is the inclusion of the retainer ring. And I'm gonna show you how we put that on here in a second. Uh, the other thing it comes with is some centering rings, and this is what's gonna allow this to glue to the inside of a BT-60. Okay, I'm also gonna use the aft ring as somewhat of a, uh, a holder for the retainer ring to go up against. Now, one thing I wanna point out that I had to modify off camera was Sometimes when you deal with different manufacturers, you get little variances in sizes. Now this retainer ring is an Estes product. This uh, 24 millimeter motor tube is an Apogee product. Now this body tube, when you slip it in the retainer ring, there's slop in there. It's not a snug fit. It wiggles, It there's about maybe a 32nd of an inch gap around it. So what I did was I took an existing BT-50 body tube, cut off about three eighths of an inch or so, and split it. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna wrap this around the end of the tube and glue it down with wood glue till it becomes permanent. And then that will allow this to glue on nice and snug. No more wiggle, no more play, it's it's sturdy. And then once we, and we're gonna glue this on with JB Weld by the way, because JB Weld is, it's, it's an epoxy type glue, but it's it's basically liquid metal that uh, it, it's hard as metal when it's done and it's also more heat resistant than standard epoxy. So since we're gonna be dealing with a high heat area, I'm, I prefer gluing this on with uh, JB Weld. But uh, once that glues on, then we can take our centering ring and glue that right up to the back of it. Our secondary ring up near the, the front end. And then once we get all this dry, then we can determine the length that we want the body tube, I'm sorry, the motor to stick out of the motor tube. Once we establish that length, then we can glue the engine block in until it makes contact with the front end of the motor. But that, that'll come on after we get the retainer ring on first. This is the first thing that needs to go on. Technically, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to glue this little um, adapter onto the back end. And for that, we're just going to use some wood glue. This is a super simple procedure. Go ahead and spread that around. Okay. And just push it down on something flat so you know it's flush with the end. So I'm gonna let this sit for a few moments. In fact, while I let this dry, I'm gonna go ahead and mix up our JB Weld. We can do that right now, actually. So let's get this going. And this is not gonna take much at all. So we can be very sparing on our mount. You want to mix JB Weld, the black and the white, until you get a nice gray color. That's that's evidence of a good mixture. Okay, now that I got the uh, JB Weld mixed up, and 
and this is fairly well hardened now. It's ready to, to glue the retainer ring on. I do want to scuff up the inside of the ring where the plastic is because it's got a nice sheen to it. And you, even though it looks pretty, you don't want that because that prevents uh, good adhesion. So I'm just going to sand the inside of that inner shoulder there where it's going to make contact with the tube. Just rough it up with some 220 sandpaper there just to give it something to grip onto. Now, if I put the glue on this ring, as I push it in, it's gonna ooze out this way. I don't want that. I want it to ooze out this way because that'll actually help give me a somewhat of a, a fillet. So we're gonna apply the glue to the tube as opposed to the, the ring. So now that this is nice and mixed up, And then after we get this on the tube, we're gonna rotate it too to help spread the, the JB weld around. So it doesn't have to be just perfect at this point, but we will spread it better. Okay, so now we got a good coat on there. Take our ring, insert it. Press it down on a firm surface. And you can you can make sure, you know, there's no gap where the cardboard meets the plastic. So that's a good a good seal right there. Now a little glue did come out, which which is okay. That's to be expected. So what we're gonna do is take a Q-tip and some rubbing alcohol and we're gonna clean that area out. So you don't want anything to hinder the uh, motor being able to slide in or out. Okay. There we go, that's clean. And let's go ahead and clean up the, uh, the outer edge too. Because that'll make gluing our centering ring on a lot easier. Kind of creating a fillet, as it were. And you definitely don't want to get any in the in the threads. So keep it off there. Okay, that looks good. Okay, we're gonna let that dry, and then we're gonna glue our centering rings on. Okay, we've let the motor mount sit overnight and allow the JB weld to fully harden and cure. And this retainer ring is on there permanently. That's that's a great thing. Uh, the next thing I want to do is set the thrust ring or the engine block in the motor tube. Now the key is to getting the distance set just right. And what I'm going to do is actually utilize a spent motor to push the ring up up into the position we want it to to be and I'll include the cap as well and that'll give us just the right uh, distance that this needs to be glued in at so what I'm gonna do first is go ahead and run a ring of glue so again this is not a precise like measure a quarter inch here or half an inch there it's just we're going to set it to where I like the cap I like the cap screwed on about halfway down um, if it bottoms out, then you really have no more room to, to maneuver. And if it's too far out, it's too close to the threads that can actually unthread itself uh, in flight. 
So you wouldn't want that. So I like it about halfway down and then I can snug it up a little bit more if I need to. So let me go ahead and draw a ring. I'm gonna use this Q-tip. And I'm just gonna run a ring around the inside of the tube. Probably take a couple applications of this. I kind of already got an idea of how far down it needs to be, so I'm sort of guesstimating on, uh, on the depth of the glue. See, it's pretty well uh, saturated with glue in there. Now I'm going to run the ring from the, the back side into the tube. Get it started there. Take my motor, push it up, and I'm going to screw it down with the cap until it's about halfway. And I'm going to stop, take the cap off move the motor and we're just gonna let that sit and dry and once it starts to harden up I can actually lay down a fillet around that which is gonna give us more uh, more resistance to this thing ever budging loose on us so I'm gonna let that sit for a few minutes make a fillet uh, but in the meantime since it's not gonna go anywhere I can also go ahead and glue on my centering rings now the rear centering ring we're gonna go ahead and place it all the way up until it starts to make contact with that JB weld line that we, we had earlier. Because um, that gives me something kind of to purchase it up against to give a little more strength to it. So this is a pretty straightforward matter of running a ring of glue around the base. Probably a little too much. Kind of spread it a little better. Okay. Slide this on and just push it up. And see, we sort of made a natural fillet the way it kind of compresses the glue. Just kind of rotate to make sure it's perpendicular to the tube. Looks good. And then when this sets up, I'm going to do a fillet around the base of that. So the same time I do the fillet up in the thrust ring, I can do my fillet on the centering ring as well. So we're going to let that sit for a bit. right back to it once it's dry. Okay, we can also go ahead and glue the forward centering ring on as well. And I want it as far forward as I can get it to give it more stability, but I want to leave enough of the tube sticking out where it gives me something to purchase my fillet around. So maybe a sixteenth of an inch or so would be more than sufficient. So let me slide this down. Just like before, I'm going to run a ring around the tube. <clears throat> it always helps if you open it, I've noticed. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna pull this up and like I said, about sixteenth of an inch from the top will stop, and it's actually gonna kind of create its own fillet from what we kind of pulled up. So let me wipe my fingers. And that looks pretty good. And like I said, it, it already created its own fillet around that side. So really when it comes to time to do the fillets, we're just gonna fillet the base of that one, the side of this one, and then the thrust ring inside the motor tube. 
So I'm gonna set that aside. And while I do, I wanna show you one other thing that I did off camera earlier to the fins to get them ready for uh, gluing onto the body. I took some wood filler, just the, you know, the typical putty that we always use to fill in grain and whatnot. And I just, I mixed it with water to thin it out and I just spread it around the outside edges of each fin. Uh, I was careful not to put any on the root because that's gonna be what's glued to the actual body tube. But I went ahead and laid, laid some in and really all we need to do is to take some sandpaper. I'll use my sanding block here and I'm just gonna smooth that out. I'm not gonna sand all the way through it. Just give me a nice smooth surface that will take the paint nicely. That way we'll have a nice smooth even edges all the way around the fin. Nice, so let me finish this one and then I'm gonna do these other three. And then these are actually gonna be ready to glue onto the body tube. Okay, while the motor mount parts are drying, I'm gonna go ahead and take this time to mark the body tube to accept the four fins. So if you remember, the slight modification we're gonna make on this design is we're actually gonna run just the four fins, not the eight, but I'm gonna run these at the base of the rocket as opposed to the uh, a few inches up is the way the original design was. So again, we're gonna modify it just a little bit where it's mounted at the base. But they give you this fin marking guide to wrap around the body tube and make the marks for all the fins. Uh, I'm going to eliminate this with one exception. I'm gonna utilize this to make a mark for where we're gonna put the launch lug. But for just initial marking of the four fins, I'm gonna use this little plastic Estes uh, fin alignment guide. And uh, it's pretty simple. You just slip it on the appropriate size there and you just find your four, four sides. And there's little notches on the plastic. You just align them to those notches. For the four fins. Like so. Then I'm gonna take my other favorite tool, this guy right here, and I'm going to align my marks on the edge, and I'm gonna draw them up. Like so. I'm gonna make the four. Now I'm gonna have to come back and do this again to get the launch lug once we get it, it marked out. But I want to get these lines on first so I'll know where to measure from to get our launch lug position. Okay, one more. Okay, so there's our four lines for our four fins. Now I want to take my guide and I want to just hold it up between any two of them, line them up. Like right here, I've got that one lined up and that one lined up. So now I've got a perfect center point. So I'm gonna make a little mark on that line. And then using this tool once again, now I can draw my line for the launch lug. Just like that. Okay, so now we've got our lines marked and I'm gonna go ahead and uh, off camera, well I can do it on camera actually. Just gonna take some sandpaper and just lightly scuff up the glaze right on the line for the four fins. Not so much that I'm gonna re be removing the, the pencil mark, but if you do, that's okay. You can just go back and remark it. But that takes that sheen off and it also gives us a little bit more porous fibers to glue the fins onto. Just like that. Okay. So now they are ready to glue the fins on. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and get this kind of cleaned up and we're gonna come back and we're gonna glue the fins on in the next segment. 
Okay, now that everything's marked up and also I wanna show you what I did additionally off camera was the instructions show actually two separate launch lugs being used about a quarter inch each. One up here and one down at the base. Uh, I have elected to not go that route. I'm gonna use one little bit longer piece, but a single. And I'm gonna mount it up at where they showed the forward launch lug. Uh, this is very reminiscent of the way the High Flyer XL is also set up. Uh, the other thing I went ahead and did was I, I did scuff up everything with some sandpaper. I marked again five inches up from the base for where the launch lug is going to go. But I also, not sure if it's even noticeable on camera, but where I scuffed up the tube is to the right side of each line. And that's because I'm going to glue the fins to the right of each line. That way I can still see the line and use it as a reference as opposed to trying to guess if I'm right on top of it or not. Uh, I've done that in the past builds that I, recently and it's worked out really well. So I'm gonna go ahead and utilize that again on this one. Uh, all these fins, I've sanded them down. The wood filler has now been sanded nice and smooth and flush. So I'm gonna go ahead and glue the first fin on, show you how I do that, and then I'm gonna do the other three off camera and then we can come back and start doing our fillets, glue on the lunch lug, so on and so forth. So let me go ahead and lay a bead of wood glue. And you've probably seen this technique done on all my other builds. I'm gonna stick with it because it works. Is uh, you put the, the bead of glue on the root edge of the fin, like so. little bit more okay that's good and then I'm gonna place it on the fin I'm sorry place it on the body and then I'm gonna immediately pull it off and let the glue start to tack up so I'm gonna set it right on the edge of that line that I have created okay and I'm gonna lift it off okay we're gonna let this sit for about a minute gives it time to harden and tack up on us and uh, Yeah, I think this is gonna work out real well. In fact, I'm considering, because the top of the fin here is still below where you're gonna have the launch lug, I might be able to glue the launch lug on. That way I can do the fillets for all four fins and the launch lug at the same time, as opposed to having to work around the launch lug, which is typical in my builds. So again, we're gonna let this sit for another 30 seconds or so, and then we'll go ahead and tack this down. Okay, so it's been a good minute, minute and a half now since it's been tacked down. So now I'm gonna, again, just replace it right where it was, being careful to line up the base and put it right on the edge of that line. Just like so. Okay, look from behind, get it perpendicular to the tube. Okay, look straight. Hold it up to the camera so you can see what we're looking at. Everything's in alignment. And we are all set. So now it's gonna, it'll hold its position because we let it tack up. So it'll hold while I do the other three fins. I'm gonna do those off camera and then we'll come back when they're all four uh, on and dried. Okay, I've got all four fins glued on. Everything's perpendicular, everything's straight. I did wrap one band of masking tape around just maybe an eighth of an inch ahead of the leading edge of the fins. Uh, just because I want to do allow you know some roundness to the front, but I don't want it to spill over too far forward. So that's kind of our barrier. Um, I usually run some masking tape in between the fins, and then I always end up cleaning that up with a Q-tip and uh, rubbing alcohol anyways. So I'm gonna attempt on this one just to forego any masking because we're just gonna run the uh, fillet down the middle anyway of the joint. So I've got my rock epoxy pretty well mixed up here. I'm gonna do the first, uh, first couple fins on camera and then I'll go ahead and do the remainder off camera but because it's gonna be the same process. But uh, let, me, let me go ahead and lay it this way. Get a 
good amount here. Just sort of lay it in. Okay, and then we'll take a nice smooth popsicle stick and let me just kind of pull that out to the edge there. And we're just gonna pull it down. You know what? Yeah, let me, I need to spread this out down a little bit more. Kind of push it down into the crack better. Okay, let me have another go at this. One smooth pull. Just like so. Okay, and we're gonna lay this remainder down on this fin. Okay, and we did get an air bubble. I'm not sure if you can see that right there at the tip of the stick. So I'm gonna kind of poke that, poke at it. There, we punctured it, and I'm gonna have to do another draw down the, the center here. Okay. There we go. Beautiful. No air bubbles that time. Push the remainder into the seam on this side. I just noticed that popsicle sticks are the absolute best thing for not only mixing the epoxy, laying it down, but also spreading it because it's got the right curvature for all of your low and mid power fillets. Um, if you're going to go high power, you probably want a, a popsicle stick with a little bit shallower curve to it. But uh, yeah, this is perfect. Okay, here we go with this side. There we go. Perfect. Yeah, no air bubbles on that one. Okay, so now I'm gonna lay this side up with the excess. And uh, we'll just continue on there and we'll, uh, we'll come back when we're all done with the fillets. Okay, as you can see, the fillets are done and I've also gone ahead and glued and run fillets on the launch lug as well. So that's all complete. Uh, one thing to note, I'm not sure if you can see that little white dot in the fillet there. I think there's uh, some white in that fillet. What those are is after the epoxy had dried, I discovered that there were some air pockets in the fillet. So I poked those to let them kind of breathe out because they were bubbling out. And then after it dried, I filled in those holes with some just some Tamiya plastic putty and just smoothed them down with my fingers. So uh, those will lay down nice. You'll never even know that they were there ever there. So yeah, uh, the fillets are drying now on the launch lug. That is good to go. One thing to keep in mind is because we laid the, the fins down just to the right of the, the line that I drew, we had to do the same thing with the launch lug. It's just offset a little bit to the right, but it's right down the middle between those two fins. So that's gonna be uh, looking good here in a minute. We're gonna let it dry. And now we're going to get back to our motor tube. Uh, the centering rings are all dried and in place. The fillets were laid down nicely. They're holding up well. So what I've done is to run my shock cord, I'm taking some 100 pound Kevlar cord and I puncture a little hole in that forward centering ring, just enough for the shock cord to pass through. And I just tied a little knot with a, a loop on one end, ran the, the Kevlar through it, and we're gonna cinch that down. Now, before we do, I wanna run a fillet of wood glue around the perimeter of our mount, of the ring there. So when we pull the, the Kevlar in, the Kevlar will go and become embedded in the glue, giving it extra purchase. Okay, this is gonna get a little messy. I don't really know how to avoid that, but I got paper towels here. I'm uh, gonna pull that into the, the fillet. Actually, I'm gonna take a toothpick and sort of just kind of run that around getting the Kevlar into the wood glue. And I'm still gonna use my finger afterwards to kind of fill it around it. But, uh, okay, let's, let's pull that nice and tight. That's as tight as we're gonna get it. 
Okay, now I'm, now I'm gonna use my finger and just kinda smear that glue around, which, like I said, it, it'll embed the Kevlar inside the glue. So no chance of slippage or uh, pulling out. So, there. Nicely done. Okay, so that is complete. We're gonna let that dry and I'm probably gonna wait till we finish painting the body tube until I actually glue the motor mount in because this is just gonna be one more thing I'm gonna have to mask off and worry about keeping the paint off while I do the painting. So I think we're gonna hold off on this until the paint is done. But uh, yeah, for now we're just gonna let this uh, dry up and we've got plenty of cord here to run out the body tube. And uh, so there we go, looking good. Okay, quick update on things. Since you saw this last, um, I've since primered it with Rust-Oleum Gray Primer, uh, two coats to be exact. And then after the primer dried, I went over the spiral lines with some wood filler. Um, pretty straightforward process. I just took some of the wood filler, mixed it with some water to make it a little bit thinner. And then just with a little paintbrush, I just painted it onto the groove, uh, let that dry. And then I just took some 220 sandpaper and just sanded it down. And I like to, personally, I like to put the filler on after the first coats of primer. That way, as I'm sanding down, if I hit bottom, I don't actually go into the cardboard. I just start to roughen up the primer. So that way I don't damage the cardboard tube at all. Uh, there's different ways of doing it, but that's my preferred method. Uh, this is what it looked like before I started sanding. So I've sanded down to the fins and that's where I stopped. So I need to continue sanding down the rest of the spiral lines and some of the uh, fillet areas where there were a couple uneven areas, I filled those in with filler as well. So I uh, just take a few more minutes to sand those down and get them smoothed out. And then what I'm going to do is once it's all sanded down, I'm going to put another one or two coats of gray primer on it. Wet, wet sand that till it's mirror smooth. Then I'm going to mask off and paint the fins alone black. So I'm going to leave the body tube primer gray because that's going to match the actual ACE unit, which is a, a primer gray color to begin with. And then I'm just going to mask off for the fins and paint them blue, I'm um, sorry, black. And I'm going to paint the nose cone black as well. So that'll kind of give it a kind of a test vehicle look to it. So that's, that's the plan. So I'm going to finish sanding these up, primer it again. And I may or may not come back and show you before I paint the fins black, but uh, very soon here, I'm gonna show you that. And then the final thing I do, once everything's painted, I'm going to install the motor tube, which is now complete. And uh, I'm gonna, again, wait till everything's painted before I actually glue this in. But uh, yeah, it's coming along nicely. Uh, once this is done, the ACE is already complete. The nose cone, I just wanna uh, bore out the hole a little bit more so I can squeeze some altimeters and some extra payload ability up in the nose. I'm gonna mask this off, primer it, and then paint it black to match the fins. And then uh, it's ready to go. So we'll catch up with you after I finish painting. Okay, as you can see, the uh, decals have been applied. Uh, hope you like them. It's uh, RAV-1, stands for RPM Ace Vehicle. And uh, you might, I don't know if the camera's picking it up or not, but uh, behind the decal, there is a gloss that you don't see on other places of the gray. Um, I also have down here on the bottom the same, it says RPM Ace Vehicle, and I've got that on all four sides. Um, but what it was was because this is primer gray and it came out kind of dull, um, I, I needed to put a gloss coat down before I laid down the decal. So what I did was I sanded the primer with a thousand grit and it still just didn't, it had a, it didn't have a, a glossy appearance to it. So I went ahead and put down some future or I, I say future, but it's the same thing as the pledge. Um, I laid down just enough around where I'm gonna put the decals. So it has that glossy surface and it worked out beautifully. After it dried, the decals laid down nice and smooth. Now I need to go back and cover the whole thing with the pledge. And that'll help not only gloss up the rest of the gray, but it also help seal the decals down to the body tube. Um, <clears throat> you can also see the, the black is done on the fins. I think that came out really well. I've also got the nose cone painted black. It's in the other room right now, but uh, you can imagine what it looks like. 
Uh, but before I clear coat it, I do want to go ahead and glue the motor tube in because once I get the motor tube glued in, I can then clear coat while this dries as opposed to clear coating it and then having to wait for that to dry to install the motor mount. So kind of kill two birds with one stone by doing this first. Um, pretty straightforward process. Going to take some wood glue. And I've got a uh, popsicle stick here with a little, I've already notched a little line on here for a distance as far as how far in I want to go ahead and run the glue bead. Um, I'm going to run a series of wraps inside with the glue, get this started, get the, at, least, at least the first ring in, and then I'm going to, with the Q-tip, run a bead around for the rear ring, and you'll see when we get to that. But let's go ahead and get the, uh, the front ring glued in. Get a decent amount here. And just sort of rotate the rocket to spread the glue. Okay, let's get a little bit more. I'll clean up that mess before I get it on something I don't want to get it on. Pretty good coverage down there. Okay, looks good. We'll go ahead and get this started. Okay, and now I'm gonna take a little Q-tip, run it on the inside of the aft section. Okay, that looks good. Now we just start twisting this as we go in. Got caught there a little bit. All right, there we go. I'm gonna put it in maybe an eighth of an inch, maybe three sixteenths or so. That looks good. Okay, and you can also see, I didn't point it out, but I, I routed the shock cord out through the, the bottom of the tube. That way it, it won't get in the way as I insert it for gluing and that keeps the shock cord dry as well. So, so there we go. All right, so now that is set right where we want it. Let me just go ahead and put the cap on, make sure it's, we've got enough uh, room to, to play with it. Oh yeah, that's good. Okay, so while that dries, let me go ahead and get a little, this is my holder, little paper towel tube. Uh, so now with this, I can go ahead and start applying our pledge. Okay, just pour a little bit in a cup. And I'm just gonna simply paint right down the center line on the gray. Oh, that looks sharp. I like that gloss that it pops out with.
nice thing about foam brush is it allows you to work over contours like the, uh, the launch lug here. There we go. I mean, I can already tell right there that gloss is going to pop. That looks really sharp. So, okay. Uh, again, now this is what I call the hardest part of modeling is waiting for things to dry. <laughs> That's exactly what we're gonna do. So I'm gonna let this dry and then we'll come up and we'll come back and do a final recap because we're, for all intents and purposes, done. Okay, the RAV1 is complete. As you can see, I can barely fit it here in the camera, but from the tail fins all the way to the nose cone, the rocket is officially done. And I want to kind of go over some of the, the details with you and kind of highlight from tail to nose how this operates, how it's going to plan to work, and what the purpose of it is. Um, if you remember, this started out as an ESAM 58, which is a uh, an Estes kit that for all intents and purposes, should be a 24 millimeter rocket, but it came with an 18 millimeter mount, so it can take Bs and Cs. Um, for this size rocket, I really wanna be able to run Ds and Es, especially for the testing that we're doing. So I did supplement the uh, motor mount with a 24 millimeter upgrade. And what that basically allows us to do is take an E motor here, I've got a, a spent E12-4, and it, it just simply slides into there. And then take the, the cap and secure that down. So that's gonna keep the motor in. Now, ultimately the purpose of this rocket is to eventually deploy the ACE unit. And I'll get to that here in a second, but before we get to the actual deployment of this, I wanna have a backup system like I've done before with the High Flyer XL. So I've made this uh, coupler right here separable. So when the motor deploys its ejection charge, it will blow the front off. And what I'm gonna have tucked in this section right here will be a 24 inch parachute and a few feet of elastic shock cord. Um, I'm, not, I'm not gonna pull it all out because I'm just gonna have to wad it back up in there. But uh, I also have a little uh, ejection baffle blanket that's tucked in here that'll help protect the chute from the blast from the motor. Uh, but again, initially, we're gonna be testing it with using this parachute. Once we get this dialed in, then hopefully we can attach this quasi-permanent. I'd like to maybe run a couple wood screws through the tube and into the ACE shoulder down here. Uh, so that's how it's going to come down, on at least on its first flight. Second flight is when we'll probably actually start trying to get the ACE to deploy. In the event that it doesn't, this will be our backup. Okay, so let me get that back on. Okay, the ACE itself. You're probably wondering, what is the ACE? Well, the A stands for Apogee Shoot Ejection, ACE. And to deploy the ACE, we need a special altimeter that my friend designed and it's called the RPM, the Rocket Performance Monitor. Uh, I somewhat highlighted this in a launch day video out at the pad one day, but I want to give you a better close-up view of it. This is the altimeter itself, and by turning it on, not sure how much you'll be able to see on the little screen, uh, but when you first turn it on, it's got to boot up and, and go through its cycle. And then when it's ready to fly, you insert it into the payload bay. Now I have a special payload bay up in the nose here for the RPM. Now the RPM can be used standalone or it can be used to release the uh, the ACE unit. Um, but you can't do the ACE without this though. That's, that's the only thing, the ACE only works with this. So before we get to the ACE, I wanna show you how we insert the RPM. So again, this little payload bay up here has a little opening and now that that wire you see plugged that's a servo motor that will plug into the ace when we're using I'm sorry plug into the RPM when we're using the ace but if we're not going to use the ace we can just leave it unplugged 
slip the RPM unit into that bay and then close it up like that. And I've got uh, on the sides, there's some notches where I can align the holes and there's two screws that keep the payload bay attached to the shoulder. Now let me take the nose cone off and you'll be able to see, actually let me take the payload bay off. There's a little cross brace in there I made and that keeps the ACE unit from sliding out of its compartment. So when this is down all the way, that cross brace is gonna sit right on top, gently applying pressure to keep it from jostling around too much. Now there is just a little space between the shoulder of the nose cone and that cross brace where I would like to, for another backup purpose, maybe install a nine or 12 inch parachute attached to the nose cone in the event the nose cone comes out. Because the nose cone, as you can see, I, I've boarded out to accept my standard altimeters. The Flight Sketch Mini and the Jolly Logic 2 will fit up in the nose cone section. Now, this does get taped to the payload bay right here. But if that were ever to jar loose and come off, I want the nose cone to be able to come down under a chute to protect the electronics on board. So that's going to be another little backup I'm going to have up in the nose. Okay, now to the big part, the ACE unit. So, assuming that the RPM was plugged into that little motor that I showed you. I'll show you that again. There's the, the connector for it. What it does is, when the ACE unit, I'm, I keep getting those backwards, when the RPM unit detects Apogee, and this is an accelerometer based only altimeter. No barometers, no air pressure sensors, nothing. Just accelerometers. So it detects launch, it detects consistent acceleration, it, it um, registers when it burns out and starts its deceleration, and through all those cycles of being able to read acceleration, it can detect apogee when acceleration comes to zero. Um, or deceleration comes to zero for that matter. When it does hit zero, Apogee, it's gonna send a signal through that wire to this motor. And there's a little motor in here, and, and I'll, when I open it up, I'll show you more how that works. But it's all based on this triggering the motor to spin to release a parachute that's in here based on the accelerometer registering Apogee. So, what does it do? Okay. Let me open this up and they say a picture's worth a thousand words. Well, I believe that to be the case. Let me open this up and show you the guts of the ACE unit. This little panel here, it's, uh, it's tethered, so, and I've got an 18 inch parachute here. Everything's te tethered together. So you can see it's t tethered here to the rocket and then the parachute is tethered to that point there. So it's all gonna stay together assuming our lines hold up. Now, what releases it? So, if you look inside at the top here, on the inside you'll see a set of magnets. There's magnets in here. So, when this is in installed, there's a little catch pin down here you have to insert first. When that catch pin's in installed, the magnets will hold it shut. Okay, what are they holding it shut to, you wonder? Well. I told you there's a little motor up in here. That's what this wire is connected to. There's two little black notches. Now, when those two lines are uh, directly across from one another, the magnets are in a north-south polarity. In other words, there's a magnet. There are a row of magnets inside of this little motor here, tube here. So this rotates. It's, it's kind of like a, an electric motor and a stator. The, the stator is, this would be considered the stator, I, I suppose. It's the outer magnets. And then you've got the rotor on the inside spinning. And throughout this rotor here are north and south facing magnets. Now, when these two notches are aligned, you've got the magnets opposite of each other, so they attract. So, and they're gonna pull on these magnets here, pulling this hatch down in fact, it, it, it took it right out of my hands. It's, it, it's very strong magnet. 
pulling it in and that's what keeps it shut during the ascent. Now when it hits Apogee and the RPM tells the ACE unit to turn the motor, the magnets inside will rotate within the stator and a new set of magnets will come up in alignment that are the same. So you know how magnets work when they're reversed they attract each other when they're the same polarity they push against each other and that's what's going to happen is that ma magnet in here when it reaches the right alignment it's actually going to push these magnets and push the hatch open when that does airflow and gravity will allow this door to pop off completely releasing the chute and anything else that's inside it's, it's that simple, yet it's complicated. I mean, the concept is simple to understand, but the engineering behind it is, is rather complex. And that's what we're, we're testing. We're testing the software in the RPM to make sure it does its job and tells the ACE when to, to spin the motor and uh, release the chute. So that's the purpose of this rocket, is to put the ACE and the RPM through its testing. Now, I've flown the RPM quite a few times on its own, uh, not even with the ACE unit attached to the rocket, just a standalone altimeter, and I've gotten good data out of it, but it needs some refinement. We're still we're still tweaking the software on that. Um, but now we're at the phase where this is becoming more and more consistent. Now it's time to start getting the ACE unit to uh, cooperate with this as well. So again, that's the whole purpose of this rocket and this test bed is to uh, test out the ACE and the RPM unit, hence the name RPM and ACE vehicle, the RAV1. So I hope that uh, little tutorial uh, kind of explained our, uh, our, our process and what we hope to gain from this testing. Um, literally from tail cone to nose cone, there really is no dead space in this rocket. You've got the, you've got the whole motor mount, then you've got a parachute system, shock cord system, the ACE unit, which is all encompassed here, payload bay for the RPM, payload bay for a backup parachute for the nose cone and the upper nose cone to house the Jolly Logic 2 and the Flight Sketch Mini and any, any other altimeters you want to test. But uh, it's fun to test with barometric altimeters to compare what we're getting with the accelerometer based one. Um, yeah, so this is it in a nutshell. Let me kind of pack it back up and we will tuck it away. And next time you see this rocket, we'll be at the launch pad. and. Uh, Hopefully that'll be in the next couple days, assuming the, the weather cooperates with us. It's been windy lately, so that's kind of been our, our drawback, but that's okay. It's given us time to refine the, the project here and get the software updated for the RPM unit. Oh. Something's catching. And this is all part of the, t oh, it was up there. This is all part of the testing, you know, what works, what doesn't, what can be improved upon. And uh, yeah, and if you, if you see anything or you have any ideas for this, please let us know in the comments section so we can uh, perfect this process. There we go, did you hear that? It just kind of sucked it in. And uh, tuck this back in. So there you have it. That is the RAV1. That is the end of this uh, build video. Again, the next time you see this is going to be out the launch pad. So uh, wish us luck. Hope you enjoyed the, the whole tutorial. And uh, yeah, looking forward to it. So we'll see you at the pad. God bless. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.